Monster. Welcome back to the Hogs Die, everybody. I am, of course, not Alex East, as you can tell. I'm a lot better than Alex East, to be perfectly honest. Um, he is on vacation right now. He skipped this Green Bay game in favor of family stuff. Imagine that. And Jamal is out. But fortunately, we have uh, our writer, Dave Earl of Burgundy, Burgundy and Gold fame. How are you today, Dave? And welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me on. And, and uh, considering the loss, I'm doing pretty well. This is the second time you, we've had you on, right? You had did another yes. segment with this. It's yes, hard for me to keep track. Changed. When you've done as many shows as we have, it's like I sometimes I can't remember who we've had on and who we haven't. Um, well, we're here to talk about, of course, Washington's loss to the Green Bay Packers, you know, by a score of 24 to 10. It wasn't as bad as I thought. Could have been, but wasn't. It also could have been a lot closer. It's just, It was a bit of a strange game. Um, so let's start out with the stats here, as always. Uh, and then we'll get into some of the details of the game and whatnot. So here we go. Taylor Heineke was 25 of 37 for 268 yards, one touchdown, one interception. Quarterback rating of 86.3. On the ground, he was 10 for 95, uh, 10 meaning 10 scrambles, 95 yards with a long of 38. Antonio Gibson was 14 for 51. DeAndre Carter uh, was one for 27. J.D. McKissick, four for 22. And in the receiving side, Terry McLaurin was seven for 122 on 12 targets. Ricky Sills Jones, six for 51. Adam Humphreys, three for 36. JD McKissick, four for 34. Dax Milne, two for 16. Antonio Gibson, two for five. And Darren Drake Carter, one for four. Um, and we're not going to play the Tressway punt game today, as we always do, which I was hoping to do since you were new, but he didn't have any punts, miraculously enough, shockingly. Um, on the Green Bay side, Aaron Rodgers was 27 for 35 for 274 yards, three touchdowns, three sacks, quarterback rating of 127.6. Aaron Jones, uh, night six for 19, um, and A.J. Dillon, three for six on the ground, which is just amazing. And in the air, Devontae Adams was six for 76 on uh, seven targets. Robert Tanyan, the tight end, who would have thought that? Four for 63. Alan Lazard, five for 60, and it goes down from there. And then on the defensive side, um, the sacks today were two by Jonathan Allen, one by Montez Sweat. And that's it. That's stats. And, um, oh, I guess we got to give DeAndre Carter some love. Four uh, kickoff returns or 100 yards. <laughs> so that's stats. So let's just start off with this game with some general impressions. I have a bunch of thoughts. But since you're new here, I'm going to stop babbling. I'm going to let you give – you go first in honor of your appearance on the Hogsty. So general thoughts on today's game. Uh, in actuality, I think this game kind of came down to three plays and our inability to once again be able to stop the tight end. Uh, the Heineke dive, as you will, into the end zone where his knee went down, which is a ridiculous rule. I understand why it's in place, but I still hate it. I, that took off points off the board because he the, the fourth thing, fourth and goal, obviously he fumbled, um, regained it, forward progress stopped. And then you had the McLaurin uncharacteristic drop. Although the last few games hasn't been too He's uncharacteristic. He's had a couple drops. Yeah, yes. he doesn't normally do that. Right. You know, and that one in the end zone was huge. It looked like he was actually trying to play to his body instead of actually kind of getting his hands out there like he normally does. See, this is a high school receiver mistake because, I mean, I was a mediocre at best high school football player. You know, nothing special at all. And, you know, what all receiver coaches anywhere is tells you is catch with their hands, right? And what he right. did is he kind of tried to – The Greg Olson said it. He ba tried to basket catch it, and what it did is it bounced straight off his – Shoulder pads instead of getting his hands out and catching it with hands. That's that's a very unlike. I don't know if I've ever seen Terry McLaurin do that. Right, and then and then also uh, Benjamin St. Juice, who I actually thought played a pretty decent game. I, I think he did pretty well against Devontae Adams today. But that one pass interference he had down the sidelines, when he in actuality he didn't have to touch Adams at all. All he had to do was just turn around and get his hands up. It probably would have been an interception. It was kind of a rookie mistake there a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. So no. my big picture, I think, takeaway from this game is, you know, I, I said it on the game preview. Green Bay had given up 15, was 15 touchdowns and 15 trips to the red zone in six weeks this year. And Washington marches in, they go 0 for 4. It got three points, one field goal. Um, uh, you know, that there's right there is the game. 
right there as a game. You don't, you, you, yes, Taylor Heineke messed up. You know, he, I don't know why he felt the need to dive. You know, it looked like he kind of got scared he was going to get hit or something, which is also uncharacteristic of him. But certainly that should have been a touchdown. And then the fumble on the end, you know, just insanity, you know, interception in the end. So the bottom line is Washington did not execute. No. On offense in the red zone. And there you go. There's a difference in the game. Because, I, listen, I mean, I thought the defense played a lot better game than I thought they would. Uh, but let's tell you what. Let's start with the offense here first. Okay. We'll get to the defense here later. So, Washington offense on Green Bay defense. Um, so, I want to go to – trying to find it here. Sorry. Halftime. At halftime – Washington's run pass balance was 13 runs, nine passes at halftime. And granted, those are terrible numbers, 79 yards on the ground, 68 yards passing. It's ridiculous. But point is, I think Washington saw what a lot of us saw, certainly me, which was that this is a game that you did not need to get into a shootout with. You needed to burn clock, and it didn't work, but they tried. You, you know, the, um, the halftime – Play clock was 12 minutes and change to 17 minutes and change. So it didn't really work, but right. they tried. But the bottom line is, to me, offensively, like I said before, it's execution. And Taylor Heineke has proven that he's, I mean, there's a, he's a backup for a reason. Do you think Tom Brady would have made that mistake and dove at the, whatever he did, dove at the goal? I know he would not have. No. And I, and I think part of uh, Heineke's first half issues was, is, although he although he was mobile, Used his legs a lot more. I believe he had what, like forty nine yards rushing in the first half alone. You know, I didn't track that. I just didn't wasn't prepared to have him scramble that much. So I don't know what the number is. <laughs> right, but I think the biggest uh, key number with him is four. He had four high throws in that first half, and that was absolutely brutal. And one of them was to McLaurin inside the ten yard line that he might not have scored, but he certainly would have got down to the one yard line. And I think, and I think that hurt. I mean, he does. He's He's done that a lot. That's almost his calling card. He throws everything high. And, I mean, Alex thinks it's because he's short, but there's other six-foot-tall quarterbacks that don't do this. I just think it's a flaw, something about his throwing motion. I'd love to get a quarterback guru on to watch this film again. Maybe I'll have to – I'll have to. I'll take that on. We'll have to do that because um, I think well, it's really not so much his height. It's just – it's something about his throwing motion that causes him to do this. Well, when I try to – when I try to kind of focus on his throwing motion in a way – you know, I noticed that when he's under a little more pressure, a little more duress, he kind of keeps the ball down. He's a little more accurate. But I said when he has that time in a pocket and he's going through his progressions, I've noticed that he's his release point on the ball is a little bit higher. I could be wrong on that, but that's what I kind of saw. Well, it's that almost makes like, sense to what we see. Right. You know, that's a good point. Maybe that's you. Know, maybe his release point is is off because he's not. He's better on the run almost. Right. He's almost better. When you know when they roll him out, then when he's just standing back there in the pocket, which is sort of the hallmark of a college quarterback, you know, right. which is kind of what he was. I mean, it almost seems like the more time you give him the process, the the more he starts overthinking everything, overanalyzing, like what was mentioned this past week, you know, and and that's where all that kind of plays in the plays into his maybe poor throwing motion on a higher release point. Or whatever. I, I I have to go back in the film and actually look at it harder, but that's just my guess. Um, and here's the other thing offensively. So yes, they tried to run the ball until they needed to pass all the time. You know, we've been down this road before. But at the end of the day, Antonio Gibson ran for 3.6 yards per attempt against uh, mediocre uh, run defense. Uh, you know, a, a, they were giving up four and a half yards carry. Green Bay was against some bad teams, you know, not great offenses. And right. what does Washington manage between the two of them? You know, McKissick, yeah, had five and a half. You know, McKissick did better. But the main bell cow, which is Antonio Gibson, not a good game. So, you know, you change. Here's how you change a game. You have Taylor run the ball in, score the touchdown. Antonio Gibson, um, a few of those carries go for more yards. You extend some drives. You have the other touchdown. It might be a totally different game. Well, he did honestly. have. Well, he did have. I think it was on a, on their third drive in the first half, or the first drive in the second half, maybe, where he had a run. I was like a, almost like a delayed draw. I think it was coming up the left hand side of the line, 
and Flowers wound up tripping them up. Yeah, that one was going for a touchdown. Oh, that was easy because you because there because nobody, yeah, there was a steep safety. That was it. Right, and everyone was playing to Heineke coming to the right as he take it off to the left, and then see that's where Heineke's legs and his ability to run came into play on that one because as he as he as he handed the ball off, he came off to the right. You you saw the linebackers draw over, and you saw I'm assuming the strong safety come up, and like you said, the free safety was isolated on that play. Yeah, and he was 15 yards down the field too, and, and you know he was in a deep zone. It looked like so. Yeah, it would have been. I think that would have been, if not a touchdown, a very long run. You know for sure. It's a real shame. You know on that one. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, in terms of other notes here, um, randomly, I think Ricky Seals Jones is producing almost at the same level as Logan Thomas. You know, this kid um, makes me wonder because Greg Olson, who was the color analyst, mentioned how good the Washington tight ends coach was. He talked about if if you guys heard this about how much that guy I can't remember his name, but how much that guy meant to his career, Greg Olson's career. Right. And I think what we've seen here is two tight ends in a row produce significantly under that guy and and so maybe it's less Logan Thomas and more just the coaching they're getting but Ricky Sills Jones has been consistently producing he produced again today six six receptions and seven targets 51 yards I mean that's more than acceptable for a backup tight end so I mean props well, to I him. think well I think Seals Jones I think it, the biggest uh the biggest problem in his career early on like with uh, the Cardinals stuff with just injury because whenever he was on the field, he always seemed to have been a pretty consistent, uh, a consistent producer. He just couldn't stay on the field. He couldn't stay healthy yeah. early on. Yeah, I agree. And um, in terms of Terry McLaurin, I, I think it was a weird game in which the numbers look huge. Seven receptions, 122 yards. But he really had another strange game. It, you know, the drop on the touch in the, the touchdown drop in the end zone we already talked about. But there were a couple other plays that – you know, at least one other catch he should have had, you know, I thought in there. And, um, it yeah, was I think that was, I think that was at, uh, I, I, I want to say it was the, uh, second and 14 or third and 11 or something like that, where, uh, kind of got him across the middle. Yeah. Yeah. It should have. Yeah, exactly. So, so it was a kind of a strange game for him. And I realized that these defenses are targeting him and they're getting, he's getting the best, you know, coverage every week. But I mean, Green Bay was down a corner or two and, a, and at least two of those were his fault. So I think he should have had a bigger game. It's hard to complain about 122 yards and touchdown. So listen to me, but still, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, it should have been, I think it should have been a better, a bigger game. Play calling wise, um, I thought Scott Turner's game plan was decent. Like I said, you know, they tried to do the right thing in the beginning here by getting a ground game going because what's the best defense to Aaron Rodgers is not let him play, right? Right. And you're just not going to get into, you're not going to win a shootout with him. At least Washington isn't. Washington ain't going to win a shootout with anybody. <laughs> um, I just wish they would have gotten Andre Carter a little more involved earlier on. So when they did that reverse and they and went down for 30 yards, it's a great play by Heineke. He had a block on the play and came downfield and recovered Carter's fumble, which I give props to Heineke for that. But a little more of that, I think, could have helped keep Green Bay a little more off balance throughout the game. They they just don't do enough of that. Well, and they're down to, you know, you know the back of the roster now for wide receivers, you know, for due to injuries. Right. You know, Cam Sims, you know, Curtis Samuel, you know, both out. Adam Humphreys has been, I hate to call anybody with a small contract a bust, but he hasn't been an impactful player. I mean, he didn't come in here with a contract that said you need to produce, as did Samuel, but still, he hasn't produced much of anything, you know, all year. And so they're down to one impactful receiver and a tight end. And so, yeah, DeAndre Carter is a highlight, you know, real. You know, that reverse. To Carter, I mean, I don't know if another player on the Washington roster could have done that. In years yeah. past, it would have been Steven Sims doing that. Right. You know, um, but it's kind of that was sort of like a kickoff because he's so deep and he's like six or seven yards deep in the backfield at that point, And, you know, his blocking is 10 yards ahead of him. It's kind of like a kickoff and which is what he's good at. Right. Um, OK, what other notes do you have on offense? Um, I think. uh Offensive line just seems to be 
I think if it wasn't for Heineke's mobility, I think we would have had a, more sacks and more pressures into, into incompletions in this game because their, their, their pass protection is just not that good this year. I think more accurately stated, it would have been a complete disaster. <laughs> yes. Yes, that is true. <laughs> if you had had Alex Smith back there who can't run at all, or at least when he was here, he couldn't run at all. How many sacks would that have produced? Uh, you know what? Actually, by the by the way, it looks like probably close to double digits. <laughs> double digits. Let's yes. hope not. I hope it wouldn't be that many. <laughs> well, at least today it would have been. And and the worst part is that we went against a Joe Barry defense. And a Joe Barry defense that was middle of the pack in sacks and quarterback pressures on top of that. Right. And you horrible know, in the red zone. And yet we go 0 for 7 basically. Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. yes, that's right. And, and I mean, granted, they were down Brandon Scherf, um, but I'm not sure um, Cornelius Lucas is that much of a downgrade over Sam Cosme. I mean, I wonder. I'd understand why he's playing because Cosme's a rookie. They need to get him in there. I get it. But right. right now, today, I'm not sure they're losing much. So really, it was only in terms of performance and effectiveness. It's been Brandon Scherf. I think I, I think our biggest issue today was interior. We had a lot of yeah. push up front, up in the middle, right there. That was our biggest problem, and you know, and Flowers didn't really have that great of a game. There was a lot of coming off that left side, coming up, forcing Heineke to roll out to the right most of the game. Yeah, yeah, and of course, I think Heineke likes to roll to the right, though. You know, he seems yeah. to be rolled to the right far more often. Um, okay, so I mean, the the summary of the offense here. Obviously, it's missed execution or missed opportunities, poor execution. Could have been a lot better or a lot different story. You get the one, you know, you have the one drop in the end zone by McLaurin and then the Taylor Heineke stupidity, you know, 14 points. Right. Right there. You know, who knows what would happen. Now, defense, let's switch over to defense here. Um, I, I said all week, I did not think that the Packers were as good on offense as they have been in years past. And I think we kind of, we sort of saw that this week. Uh, they, they brought their tight ends in. Their tight ends haven't produced anything all year, except for today. Um, it's really been the Devontae Adams, Aaron Rodgers show for the most part. Right. Um, uh, but they didn't really produce too much. I, I mean, I was expecting a lot. I, I predicted a lot more just because I thought Washington's defense would surrender, but I got to give them credit for at least the first, maybe two and a half quarters. The defensive line was dominating. They didn't, yeah, you know, was. Chase Young didn't get any sacks, so he still, you know, won on the year, far below what he should be. But Jonathan Allen looked like a one-man wrecking crew in there. Right. Well, I mean, to go to Chase Young real quick, though. I mean, you take away that punch in the face that he had, basically, where his eyeball was practically scraped out. I mean, he had pressure all day long. I mean, every time Rogers rolled to his right side, Young was right in his face every time. Uh, every time, sweat on the other, you know, sweat on the other side. You know, with his, what, I think he got one, one and a half sacks today. He was credited you know? with one by ESPN, at least. Yeah. And, I mean, he was he was just wreaking havoc on the Packers left hand, uh, left side of the line pretty much most of the game. But isn't, like, almost getting there kind of like asking a supermodel on a date and she says no? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I if get you're your Chase point. Young, I grant it. I understand. You know, if you look at some of the advanced stats, um, I obviously haven't looked at them yet for this game, but uh, I mean, they were their middle, upper middle of the of the pack and things like pressure percentage, uh, you know, and blitzing percentage and all that kind of thing, you know, quarterback hits. Um, yes, Chase had a, you know, impactful game in some respects. But when you're the second overall pick and you're talking about 20 sacks and all that stuff between the two, remember he said something about that in the beginning of the year? Yeah, I and mean, him and Sweat would break the uh, team record for a single season. It's just season. not good enough. Yeah. It is not right. good enough because if you take Jonathan Allen away from this game, what do you see? Not nearly as much pressure. Jonathan Allen, and why did Jonathan Allen have that? Does anybody know? Well, it was because the starting center did not play the game. That center was Green Bay's backup center. You know, and so he took advantage of a good matchup and, you know, God bless him. Um, so, so uh, yes, they had an impact. I think this was probably defensive line's best game overall. That was my view. No, I agree. Um, I think, of course, Jonathan Allen had a, had a great game, sure. Uh, but I, I, I just think when it comes to 
the pressure of putting on Aaron Rodgers, you really just saw how much he thrives under pressure too at the same time. It's just, you, it's just so hard to rattle Aaron Rodgers. And well, even you're not going to rattle him. I mean, no, he's right. not going to get rattled. <laughs> right. So it's just, I mean, he gets up and he's almost like smirking at people. <laughs> you, you notice this? He's so right. arrogant about it. And I, you know, I, I guess I would be too if I was Aaron Rodgers because I'm good at being arrogant and I'm not Aaron Rodgers. Um, well, but he, he almost, well, yeah. Well, he did that the uh, sweat when they were inside the red zone. He came yeah. sweat. Yeah. Yeah. He's smirking so. at him. He's kind of laughing at him. He's like, oh, you know, haha, you, know, you didn't get me. <laughs> In terms of coverage and whatnot, um, not as nearly as many obviously blown coverages as we've seen in the past. I didn't notice. We'd have to go back and watch the uh, All-22, which, by the way, I mean, NFL Game Pass, All-22, they've ruined it. Yes, it came back, but it's in a, but you only get the one sideline view. It seems to be impossible, to much harder to pick plays, and there's no way to slow it down. And I don't know what NFL Game Pass is thinking. <laughs> they need. Yeah, I, I want a refund, please. But anyway, I thought the secondary played a better game. And it, it, yeah, sure, Aaron Rodgers found some holes in the zone and everything, but he's Aaron Rodgers for God's sakes. I did not see, aside from Ben St. Juiced getting picked on, see how many is see. So Rodgers had 35 attempts. I think he threw 34 of them at Ben St. Juiced, you, you know. <laughs> Um, but I thought it was a better day overall. And that's, I think in part why we also only saw 24 points. Right. Well, I, I think the only real big standout outside of that was, uh, how they isolated, um, Jamin Davis on Tony on a 20 yard, uh, touchdown right there. Yeah. You know, and, and you lost that battle. Yeah. Right. So it's just, it's, I know, I know he's a rookie and he was brought in to cover tight ends, but. Well, it's poor coverage. Uh, if you notice, yeah. uh, Olson, Greg Olson pointed this out again. He was pretty good. He pointed out how Davis had inside leverage, and but it was a outbreaking like a post type pattern, right? And when nobody's out there, uh, you know, Davis has no hope. You know, it was just over. So I thought it was um, poor, poor defense by Davis, if you ask me, because that's something like a pro, like you and I wouldn't be able to pick it up, but you ought to be able to pick up, have some clues about should you take inside outside leverage. <laughs> Right, you know, and I would probably def default to outside when you've got a safety over the top in the middle. So I thought that was poor coverage by Davis. Oh, and and um, ta I forgot to read out tackles. Um, so see, Landon Collins had seven tackles. Cam Curl, Cole Holcomb had six. Davis had five, and then uh, I'm not going to read all these. But Chase Young had two. For those wondering, yeah. So that's tackles, not a ton. <laughs> um, what else on defense do you have? Um, well, once again, Holcomb just has no clue on how to cover anybody coming off the line. He knew that though. It's like, you know, I know it's, it's, they're down to like one working linebacker most of the time. But if I, it was a, I'm trying to find a play, but I think it was, I believe a third and eight and Holcomb didn't give any, any contact off the line at all. Completely gave. The inside seam to, uh, I believe it was Tunyon again, or, or I, no, it was on um, Mercedes Lewis, you know, and completely let him release to the inside and untouched. And he, and he just started walking out to the flat until he decided to turn around and look around. And Mercedes Lewis already had the completion. I believe he went for like 14 yards for first. I down. mean, I know it's like in vogue to hate Jonathan Bostic and all of that, but wouldn't it have been better if they had Jonathan Bostic also out there? I mean, seriously, did, is he, was, did he have a good season? No, you know, no. I'm not saying he did, but he's also a valid starting linebacker. And how many times I'm, I'm interested to see the snap counts tomorrow morning. It's not out yet as we're recording this. I think we're going to see more two linebacker sets this week than we did the past two weeks. Look like there were less one linebacker sets. So maybe they're starting to, to, to um, trust Davis more, I, but we'll have to see. But again, I think they'd be better with Bostic out there than have him not out there. You know, right. It's, it, it, it is what it is, obviously. And I um, thought, and and I thought Collins had a pretty pretty much a mixed game today. I thought he was pretty active in the backfield, pretty good against the run. And he, and I noticed they didn't isolate him too much in coverage in this game either. So. I would like to point out that that's a particular Hogstye member who shall remain unnamed. Who did a film study of Lyndon Collins when Washington signed him? And in that film study, this particular writer said this guy is a linebacker. 
Mm-hmm. At the time, everybody ignored it and nobody said anything. But I, <laughs> I could have sworn I heard Ron Vera say this man is a linebacker this week. Right. Now, you can go hunt that out. You can go search for it and see which Hogstye writer said that. I won't tell you. But somebody said that on this <laughs> show. Because, you know, Rick Snyder pointed out that he said it two weeks ago. Well, we said it two years ago. That's all I'm saying. Right. Because I do think in all serious, I said that, by the way, for those of you who are really, really dense. Because, <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think you add 15 pounds to this guy and he's a weak side starting weak side linebacker. He's almost that now. Right. Uh, you know, but he's not good in coverage. I mean, we know that. And so if Washington uses him the right way. You don't have him in things like deep zones, which we've seen this year. I think he's much more effective. And so call him whatever you want, but call him linebacker, call him a sick, call him whatever. Call him grandma's brownies. doesn't matter. you got to put him in the box going downhill. That's where he's effective. And they largely did that today, it seemed like to me. Right. And then, I, and then, you, have, uh, and then you have Danny Johnson, who was pretty much abused by Aaron Rodgers. Most well, he game. made some decent form tackles, though, at least. No, he did. He did, yes. He did watch the, you know, watch the tape on tackling, you know, on the basics of tackling, which is stuff we haven't seen from a lot of other people in the secondary. In fact, when uh, I believe it was in the Packers' first drive in the, in the second half, it was, uh, thir- it was third in eight, I think it was, and he had a great open field tackle on um, Lazard, I think it was. Who Lazard, by the way, had a career series against us. Five catches, 60 yards, and a touchdown to close out the first half. But I, I never <laughs> would have guessed Lazard would have been the guy. No. I, I mean, honestly. Well, I mean, the problem was is that, you know, Aaron Rodgers had him ice. Well, notice he was isolated on Danny Johnson most of the game. You know, now it was what? Like now, five, nine. Yeah, Lazard right. Lazard is six, five. Yeah. Now, whatever they did in the second half to change that up. Uh, I noticed that Dan Josh started getting a little more help on him in the second half, but it's just on, you know, on that final draw on a final touchdown drive of the first half. I mean, it was just Lazard, Lazard, Lazard all the way downfield. It was just, come on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, Lazard at halftime, five receptions, 60 yards, Lazard at the end of the game, five receptions, 60 yards. So yes, yes. they did figure it out. Right. I, I so. think, you know, Denny Johnson is playing because obviously William Jackson did not play, right? Correct. So he's the next guy up. And so what we saw was St. Juiced and Fuller are the outside corners. Danny Johnson was in the slot, whereas normally what you'd have is something not that. <laughs> you'd have William <laughs> Jackson on the outside and probably Fuller on the outside by default. And then someone else, St. Juiced or someone else in the slot. I mean, I don't think that's a good matchup either, but. No. Um, well, and. You know, and the bright side is, is Apke stayed off the field. <laughs> he's been off the field, though. They haven't let him yes. on the field like all year. No. Um, I, I mean, he's on the team because of special teams prowess more than anything, you know. Right. And that's the only reason he's left. Um, so anything else on defense? Um, I mean, nothing else really sticks out in terms of defense. That. Uh, yeah, so... Um, the Packers only had nine drives in this game. <clears throat> and part of the reason was Washington's drives, they didn't have a three and out in the entire game, which yeah. is a miracle because I can't remember another game where that happened. So if you go down the list here, Washington's drives, first drive touchdown, then they had the missed field with a blocked field goal, you know, blew it. Blow it, blew it, blew it on that game. I, I thought the kick was, um, it was low. It, it, yeah, I mean, it was I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, he barely got it over the uh, center's head, basically. So somebody we calling for his head. You know, I'm just wondering. You know, Dustin Hopkins is sitting at home watching this, wondering if that's going to happen. But, well, he's still available. Yeah, he is still available. Yeah. <laughs> um. So the next drive, you know, they went for a fourth down, didn't make it into the half, and then the fumble you know, on the first drive of the second half, which was. The um, Heineke, you know, pass, hit, fumble thing. And then they went for the next drive and went for it on downs again, you know. And that um, was the uh, drive with the Heineke. That was the crazy. Dive for, right? You're right. That was the crazy yeah. drive. I, you know, and then same thing again, next drive. Went for it on fourth down, didn't make it. Um, so, but all these drives, you know, the next one, 13 plays. So the next, so point here is 
eight plays, nine plays, five plays, another drive, 11, 11 plays, no points, 13 plays, interception in the end zone. And that's the one thing. The Packers didn't do anything to stop us. We just stopped ourselves. Oh, it's funny you say that because if you look at the box score, my little beginning beginner's math here says that Washington had 430 yards of total offense, whereas Green Bay had a little over 300. That would have been, what, uh, 304. Or, uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, 304 yards. So they outgained. What's the difference here? Mistakes. Right. Lots of execution. You know, that's what bad teams do, whereas good teams can have sort of a off day offensively right. and they're still going to do enough to win. And that's what and we you, saw here. Green Bay is a good team. Washington isn't a good team. And so if Washington isn't perfect, uh, you know, even with a better performance by the defense, um, you know, they still get, you know, they, you know, the uh, Packers still beat the line, you know? And, and, and just like you alluded to uh, in the beginning of the show, it's just oh for seven in the red zone against a very, very bad Red zone defense it was all for four, but yeah, not seven, but yeah. Well, they had well, they had a total of seven trips, only one, what, what, three points, right? In the I red zone, it was right? Four trip, I believe it was four trips to the red zone. I think oh. it was four trips in the red zone in the first half. I think it was a total of seven trips. I thought. Well, let's see here. Let's make sure I'm getting this right. So the first touchdown was a forty yard touchdown. So that was not red zone. Right. The missed field goal. Or uh, yeah, the missed field goal was kicked, was a forty-two yard kick, so that was not in the red zone. Okay. The turnover on downs was at the Green Bay twenty-seven, so that was not in the red zone. Uh, you, and, you, you you know what I'm thinking of? They they had they had a couple of trips in the red zone, and the sacks took them back. Yes. Penalties and so forth. So I'm kind of keeping that in my mind as yeah. a trip to the red zone. So, okay. Uh, you can I count it you. as you want. Yeah. Uh, right. I didn't count it like that. Um, no, sorry, you're ESPN. right. You're right. You're right. ESPN is now blaring in my ear. There you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So, I, I mean, that's how I see the game. You have any concluding thoughts before we move on to game balls? I was, I was kind of encouraged a little more today than I was in the last few weeks. I mean, all in all, we still lost. That still hurts. You know, I still, you know, and, and me, I still wear the losses on the sleeve, even though I'm still kind of numb to it now. It's almost expected every every year to have these heart crushing defeats and so forth. But, you know, that's just that's just the way I'm built. You know, it's just but, one of those things where you're like the loss isn't too you're trying to find victory in a loss, something good about a loss. I'm not I'm not one for moral victories, but I'm moral at a victory, point. Thank you. Yeah, right. But I but I'm at a point now where I try to find some good in any game if at all possible. Most of the time it fails. I'll admit that most of the time. But you know, when I live where I live at, I gotta try to find something. Have anything you told to hold the world where you live? Well, yeah, in Philadelphia. I live right okay, here in Philly. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't oh, want yeah. to say it if you hadn't said it out loud, but no, yeah, he lives I'm, in the heart I'm, of Satan's country, you know, which is <laughs> Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, my concluding thought, this game pretty, pretty much, it went like I thought from a Green Bay standpoint. Um, I thought Washington's offense did better than I thought it would. I, I, I'll say this much. I thought it was going to be a total zero because there's so much negativity around this team right now. Off the field, on the field, just a ton of injuries. I thought the offense and the outplay, I thought the offense outplayed what I thought was going to happen defensive wise. I think I was basically right in saying the green Bay offense isn't all that. Right. You know, um, now I say that having said that I thought my final score prediction was 38 points, but that was because I thought Washington was going to lay down and die. Right. So that didn't happen. So that's good. Um, so yeah, if you want to take a moral victory, it's, they didn't lose as badly as they could have. There you go. <laughs> okay. Guess, game balls. Okay. Uh, um, I'll go first to give you a chance to think since you're, you're the, this is the first time that you've done this. Um, again, this is another game where it's a bit hard to give a game ball, I think, here because, you know, Taylor Heineke isn't getting a game ball from me. You know, you flubbed the touchdown at the end. I'm sorry. And Terry McLaurin also isn't going to get a game ball because you dropped touchdowns. You dropped a touchdown, you dropped another pass. So the two obvious candidates 
are out on offense. So I'm going to go, this is by default here, Ricky Seals Jones, because I thought he had a pretty good game. He stepped up. He didn't put up great numbers, but the other people he played with sure don't deserve a game ball. So he's going to get one by default. And on defense, um, Jonathan Allen looked like a beast out there for most of the game. You know, he had the two sacks. He's leading. I think he's got five sacks now on the season, which is a lot for seven games for an interior defensive lineman. So good, you know, good on Jonathan Allen. Hopefully the rest of the NFL is seeing what he's doing. So I'm going Ricky Sills Jones by default and Jonathan Allen. Okay. Uh, Offensively, uh, it's It's it's, a tough one. Yeah, it is. I, cause I share your thoughts on Heineke and, you know, and uh, with uh, McLaurin and so forth, uh, having Gibson a crucial fumble, which why he wound up not losing, uh, because uh, he wound up uh, uh, Chase Roy having the awareness to jump on it because Savage never controlled it. Um, but uh, I, I See, guess I can tell I guess, you think you're thinking it's hard. <laughs> I know you're mumbling, you're babbling, trying to think of an answer. Yes, you are absolutely right. You know what? I'm going to give it to McKissick. I'm going to give okay. it to McKissick for one play, that screen play. Out to the left, none of his blockers were there. He had like four Packers around him. He had a great move. It was the first, our first drive in the fourth quarter, in the first half, second half, sorry. And he took it 11 yards for the first down. I mean, he just, he basically got all that on his own. So, hey, look, I mean, it, it, you know, the good thing about McKissick is he, uh, totally he had eight touches for uh, 56 yards, which is a pretty good game for. Right. Backup running back. Okay, so McKissick, there's one. And on defense, we're going what? Defense, I will give it to uh, – it's you know what? I'll give it to Montez Sweat. I think Montez Sweat had a very good game coming off the edge right there. He had multiple pressures all game. He got home one time. And I think I think Rodgers definitely was feeling him all game long. So – there you go. So you heard it for here first. Dave's first award of our ridiculous, totally meaningless game balls. J.D. McKissick, Montez Sweat. So that's it. The good news here is here, the game was different enough that we didn't have to, we couldn't have just played a tape of an, of an old game and inserted Green Bay and got the same results. You know, it was an exciting game to watch. So if you were uh, agnostic about these teams then you probably had an entertaining day. So for us, like I've told you today, I've said on the, you've probably heard me say this a million times. I, these losses don't affect me anymore. I've been the, doing this show like we've done for so long. It, it's beaten all emotion out of me. So, you know, and, and that, it's just another loss. And that might be the worst part. Cause you and I grew up in the uh, golden era, watched all that winning football. And then we watched, Dan Snyder come in and completely crumble it to the ground in record time. It's just, it's horrible, man. It's <laughs> it terrible. Is. It just hurts, you know? Yeah, it does. You got to just kind of laugh at it, you know? Yeah, I always yeah, tell people because I live in Texas. And so people always think they're going to come at me with Dallas stuff and all this. And I just say, look, man, there's nothing you can possibly say that I haven't already said about this team in front of in the entire Redskin world. Right. You can't you can't affect me. There's nothing you can say that's going to affect me because I guarantee you I've already said it or and in fact, in fact, I will say living in Philly this past week, same thing. I had right, I, and and I had a buddy of mine I work with. I usually don't get emotional or riled up about anything, but when he made out a comment, it was like, "So you have no idea what a disgruntled fan is." I was like, "Dude, stop! <laughs> you have, have you not absolutely... watched Washington for the past twenty five years." Right. You know, it's just like, so needless to say, I got a lot, I got attention from a lot of people around me, but hey. (laughs) All right. So that's going to wrap it up. We went way over time, but you know, again, what are we going to get? So I'm going to get a Yankees off the air. It's okay. So we will, that's it. Thanks today for appearing. We will be back with the Denver Broncos game preview. Exciting here on Thursday. See y'all next time. Thank you very much.